honestly feel like there's not much literary about this. They assemble the world's greatest literary creations to blow things up. I swear to God, this movie has almost nothing to do with books. I, that's the shocker, is that these could be anybody, really, is that you're absolutely right. But that's not a compliment to this movie, that it doesn't feel like characters from past books. That is to its detriment, that they end up feeling like these generic types that have little or nothing to do with the characters they're named after. I, I mean, admittedly, part of the joy of reading the comics is like, oh, yeah, I get that reference and seeing how he's tying all these different literary works together, that is the enjoyment or sometimes detriment to it when you don't get all the references. Here, it is pretty generic feeling. Oh, and it's sometimes painful. I wonder if these lines would work in a comic book. Like we already said, Phantom, how operatic. That one might work. That's kind of like a Roger Moore line. It might be a Sean Connery line from a Bond movie. I, you know... <laughs> The bedroom, Mina, does it give you memories or ideas? I'm like, ugh. The one that kills me is when they come out to see Captain Nemo's chauffeur call yeah. me Ishmael. I'm like, when did Moby Dick come in here? Shouldn't you be on a boat going after a whale, not driving Captain Nemo around London? Well, see, he survived Moby Dick, and the, the best he could get... Yes, that's the joke. The best he could get was to be on the... Uh, Nautilus. Although the Nautilus is pretty awesome. I got to say, all the design ideas for this movie, I'm down with. But uh, the team, what the next part of this is, what a large part of this movie is, is assembling a team that never coheres. I mean, I never feel like these guys are on the same page in any book. Yeah, we get this team being put together by M, who you're thinking James Bond. I don't know. Is that like an, you guys did the James Bond series? Is M an actual designation like in the British Secret Service? Yeah. But here's what's funny is Alan Moore created M for the comic book thinking of James Bond. And then they cast Sean Connery here after that. Playing Q, no less. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so you have James Bond reporting to M. In fact, they were talking about having Roger Moore also have a cameo in this. They decided to save it for the sequel. Oops. Roger Moore has been brought into those League books. Like, they do have a James Bond character now. They, they can't call him that. But this team. All right. So we got Quartermain with our main star. And then we second have Captain Nemo. Now, a long time ago, I read 20,000 Leagues. And I'm impressed that they did indeed make him Indian. Usually you see him as a British guy, but the actor who plays him, I get very little out of him. He doesn't emote much. He's very stoic. I kind of like when he goes into ninja moves, I walk a different path. But the rest, he's just not a character to me so much as a statue. Correct. Yes. He's a guy in a turban and a beard. And he does some kung fu moves because everyone here has martial arts skills <laughs> because it's directed by the guy who did Blade. But... <laughs> Where is the Captain Nemo from Jules Verne? Nowhere. Yeah, there's no spark to him. They bring him in as the Q. He's got the gadgets. He's got the sub. He's got the automobile. But I don't get anything out of him. He's just a body there. He's the one who has the least desires. At one point, he's worshiping Kali, which from... <laughs> is he pulling hearts out of people? Yeah, I was thinking Temple of Doom. <laughs> and they... Use that as a suspicion that he might be a traitor. But I'm like, he can't be the traitor. He's absolutely nobody and wants nothing. He is just compliant to do whatever. And the only thing he wants is to brag about how fast his boat is. Yeah, he does seem like if you want a the badass character that doesn't really have any character, but does some cool things and has some cool toys like that is Nemo in this film. Yeah, I like his car and I like the <laughs> ship. You do? OK. Yeah, no, I think it looks cool. I don't know that it belongs here and I certainly don't like the way it's used later in the middle of this movie. But yeah, no, I like all of these ideas, particularly the ship, that it looks like this giant sword cutting through the ocean okay since you brought up this ship here's my problem like when we finally get the reveal they're at a bay like in england and this thing is like as tall as a skyscraper and you can like the design here you're worrying about ropes going into zeppelins i'm like how deep is this bay <laughs> 
I don't ask those questions. You shouldn't ask those uh, kinds of questions in a steampunk movie. Yes, that's my problem. They go so ridiculous at times with this. I'm just like, I don't get the physics here. Yeah, there is no physics, but I, it's, again, it's just like they're diving suits. You know what I really love is when you go inside. They have a this half globe of the world, and they kind of track where they are with this little <laughs> needle. It's like a record yeah. player. Yeah, I, it's just cool. It's fun. It makes you wish it had a movie that served it better. And of course they. We said in our Indiana Jones retrospective that Indiana Jones didn't originate the Red Lines traveling segue, but it's where I know it from, and they do it here. And in a movie with Sean Connery, I'm like, oh, so we're going to Indiana Jones, The Trip of the Nautilus. Yeah, ultimately, Captain Nemo gets them from London to Venice, but he doesn't have a character arc. That is the only arc you're going to see. He doesn't even get a good nemesis or much of a fight. Nope. I mean, what about some of these other characters? I don't know if they get arcs necessarily some are better characters you have mina harker who teamed up with van helsing once upon a time to hunt down dracula well i recently reread dracula i did a books and nachos on it one halloween not a fan controversially but she was dracula's victim and the wife of jonathan harker and harker the man and van helsing kind of teamed up but i gotta give stoker some credit Mina did a lot on her own, too. You know, Sister was doing it for herself back in Dracula. Here, they're saying that she retained some of the vampire powers in the novel. She was cured. I'm down for having a vampire show up, and a sexy one is better. I'm not sure they succeeded at sexy by casting Peter Wilson, but I'm still happy to have a vampire. Uh, she's a daywalker, right? She's like Blade. She can be in the sunlight. <laughs> she uses a mirror compact. Is any of this movie during the day, though, Stuart? That this movie seems so dark to me. Like it's all at night or in the submarine. No, she's definitely hanging out on the deck of the boat at some points in the daylight. Oh, that's right. There is some daylight. She checks the mirror quite often, and I, I think she's an okay-looking woman. I don't know why you're so harsh on Peta Wilson. I'm not saying she's ugly. I'm saying she's not a seductress. No. Her best moments, like, where I do find her, I don't know if attraction is the right word, but I like the look of her is, like, after she's attacked someone and she's got that blood splattered on her face and she's got her yeah. compact out and cleaning up. She does have this, like, look of innocence after she's done this horrific thing that she sells me. Yeah, there's yes. something kinky about that, but... No, she's just... If they're bringing her in to seduce Dorian Gray, she seems a little frigid. I'm okay with her. I'm not okay with Dorian Gray. I don't know why... <laughs> They went there. Is this a Johnny Depp cosplayer? I thought it was just a Jim Morrison wannabe. <laughs> I don't get Jim Morrison, but Johnny Depp kind of makes sense. And this did open against Pirates of the Caribbean and lost very badly. Ooh, okay. <laughs> but yeah, you know, Stuart Townsend is mostly known as the guy that took over for Lestat after Tom Cruise said he wasn't doing the sequel to Interview with a Vampire. And then I never saw him again. And yeah, he... Like so many people here, he just brings nothing to the party. He's a vain, you know, we'll find out he's an enemy. It makes no difference to us. We don't feel betrayed because I don't think we were ever pulled in to his character. No, that's what I'm saying. Like Mina and Dorian, they have more character, but they don't have arcs, really. They're not that far away from Nemo. Like, we, we said a lot of bad about Captain Nemo, but I don't feel like these characters are given much more to do. They have more scenes, I guess. I actually think these two play well against each other. I think that, you know, I, I'm going to go back to our Legend of the Superheroes here and where mm. each hero had its nemesis. And these two are each other's nemesis. We don't know that until Dorian Gray reveals himself to be the traitor. But by having their seductress scene, by having him be a traitor, by having him have this immortality. He doesn't even necessarily want to be. He's being blackmailed by M because M has the painting that keeps him alive forever. There is more depth there than a stone statue, okay? There's there's something going on. Yeah, no, I agree there's more, but... It's not tremendous. None of these are quarter main is what I'm saying. No, no yeah, they're more interesting, I think, partly because I think Mina's more interesting 
And because they're both immortal, you know, they both have the same thing. They're going to be young forever. There's a wickedness to both of them. But no, let's not over-exaggerate it. Neither one of them are particularly exciting. Nobody on this team is very exciting. I guess the Invisible Man has some spunk. Yeah, he's my favorite outside of Quartermain. And he doesn't get much screen time, but he's invisible. But, yeah. but I think he has some good jokes. I like his look with the pancake makeup. He's kind of got a Morpheus thing going on with some of those sunglasses. But Well, yeah, because they got to cover the actor's eyes. Here's, I wish he was just a total digital creation. Like, I love the look when it's just some of that white makeup smeared across his face and a trench coat. What's weird is they don't follow continuity here. Like, he's, you know, got a little bit of makeup smeared and he's invisible then they cut and they get in a car and it's like just the actor with white makeup all over him and then they get out of the car and they're back to that digital shot like just go digital it looked good like do you know how much that cost jacob they didn't have the money yeah <laughs> oh i know it, i'm sure it cost a lot but it's it's the best digital effect in this movie the effects work here are, are really you can go from a great looking shot to a really terrible one very quickly here i i know why they did it jacob i maybe you could complain about continuity but I think we're always at our best when we can see the actor giving a performance. And not to get too technical behind the scenes, but if you listen to that special effects commentary, the one thing I got out of it is a new effects supervisor was brought in with like six weeks to go or something insane like that because the last one wasn't working out. And then he hired 20 effects houses in order to <laughs> wow. come in and do what needed to be done on a shoestring budget. Yeah, it, so much of this feels like, yeah, moments work, and then some, they just didn't have the time to fix that shot, and they're butted up right up against each other. But for the most part, Invisible Man is cool. I had seen this a lot. You, I think, Arnie, you mentioned the John Carpenter movie, Memoirs of an Invisible Man, that had been out years before. and Hollow Man did it really well. I enjoyed Hollow yeah, Man. Yeah, Hollow Man. Yeah, I feel like there had been already movies to play with this. This wouldn't have been fresh for people in 2003 to see an Invisible Man. We had seen it a couple times. But this is not a bad version of it, effects-wise. Yeah. And then, that is the first crew, and I'll admit, just trying to get these guys together is dragging for me. It is taking too long when they get to Dorian Gray's house, and I'm realizing thank God they don't have origin stories for all these people, but... Read the book. <laughs> all their different books. <laughs> yes. It's still the origin of building the team is laborious. And then when we're at Gray's house and they get attacked by the Phantom who just happens to be there and... Yeah, come on, they're giving it away. Yeah, it's too obvious that the Phantom is there and doing these machinations. And he he's also just standing there, like, not threatening. He's like, yeah, you guys want to join me? No, then we'll kill you. It, it looks foolish. Let's put a fine point on it. The performance... Everything about this, this is a terrible villain. Seeing him stand there in that mask, giving that performance, even though we'll find out later that it's another man imitating something, that doesn't make it any less silly looking. This is not a credible threat. And I think that's just the big problem is on top of the fact that the team doesn't seem to be coming together, but they're coming together to fight. Basically, they're going to be the bodyguards for a bunch of world leaders in Venice so they don't get attacked by this guy. Ugh. And then Tom Sawyer. I just do not think he fits in here. Shane West, not very familiar with the actor, seen him in a few things. Not, I mean, not very good ones. Uh, Dracula 2000. <laughs> I didn't really know him, but he has credits that I did know. Like, uh, strangely enough, Peter Wilson was in one TV show of La Femme Nikita, and he was in another one, <laughs> the one that was just called Nikita. He also was on ER for a while, but Tom Sawyer. Here's the thing. I've read a lot of Mark Twain, so it's a character I know very well. I don't get any Tom Sawyer off him. I don't know. I don't see no, it. They, why not just make it Johnny Appleseed? I mean, yeah. You're right. It could be anything. Paul Bunyan, whatever. You know, it doesn't something American. That's basically all he is. He's the token American. They're, they're like, what American novel do we have that's in 1899 that we can yeah. take from? That you're right. You've put a peg on it that I couldn't. Twain has such a virtually poetic, ironic way of writing and humor too. Yeah, you know, he's funny, mm -hmm. and this guy ain't funny. 
No. In deleted scenes, we find out he's actually on this mission to avenge his fellow agent, Huck Finn. I don't even re- remember that, but it just sounds awful. <laughs> uh-huh. Look, yeah. I, I, and again, I can see them trying. Like, I get why you have a younger character that shoots guns because he's crazy American. So he's always firing those guns. It's there to service the star of this film, Sean Connery's character, Quartermain. Like, I, they, they attempt to do a story here, like this father yes. and son thing. Yep, That's a yep. big deal. I, I see it, but it's weird. It just, it doesn't work. Like, I could see what they're trying to do, but it doesn't, it falls flat. You don't feel it. That's the reason why. Because they're telling us, oh, I lost my son and blah, 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 blah. At no point do we feel that loss or see that connection between them. I think partly because, like so many actors here, I just don't think Shane West is that interesting to 